Hey, how's it going everyone and welcome back to another video. This video is going to be a little bit different than a lot of my normal tutorials. In it, we're going to kind of take a step back and look at some tips, tricks, shortcuts, hacks, all sorts of things that will make your experience working with Jupyter Notebooks better. I use Jupyter Notebooks for like 95% of my data science work. So having these kind of in your back pocket, it's definitely helpful and definitely, you know, good to know. Before I dive into tip number one though, I want to say thank you to our brilliant sponsor today, and that is Brilliant. Org. Brilliant.org is a platform that allows you to learn math, physics, computer science, and other subjects interactively. Specifically, when I was playing around with their platform, some of the courses that caught my eye immediately was a Python class. But even better than that, I thought, was a lot of the classes that they have on algorithms and kind of computer science logic. I think the reason I like a lot of these interactive courses so much is that they allow you to kind of think about these computer science, these very technical things in a much friendlier, much easier to approach manner. So you can like dive in in that way. And so that when you do get into the weeds and do get into really challenging, tough stuff, it, it is much easier. So a lot of great courses some that immediately come to mind are algorithms and implementations. The one that I liked was thinking with graphs. There's also applied computer science concepts like search engines, cryptocurrency, quantum computing. So I definitely think it's worth checking out the platform. It's free to get started. And then if you do want to subscribe and get kind of that full membership, right now I'm offering 20% off to the first 200 people that sign up using that link. That is brilliant.org slash Keith Galley. Thanks a lot to Brilliant for sponsoring this video, but let's dive into some awesome Jupyter Notebook data science tips, tricks, and shortcuts. All right, to get started, open up a new Jupyter Notebook. And for the sake of this video, I'm gonna assume that you've already set up Jupyter Notebooks. But if enough people request it in the comments, I can make a video on how to set up a Jupyter Notebook environment. But open up a new notebook. And the first thing that we're gonna to touch on, the first trick, and this is one you might know, but you might not know all the caveats, is running commands in Jupyter Notebooks. So when I run, say running commands, I mean like any Linux command, any bash command, whatever you run in your terminal, you can run in Jupyter Notebooks. So to do that, to specify something as a bash command, you can start with an explanation point. And just for the sake of cleanliness, I'm gonna first make a markdown cell. Tip number one is running, run terminal commands, in Jupyter. Okay, so to do this, you're going to want to specify in a code cell with a exclamation point. That's basically telling Jupyter Notebooks, hey, this is a bash command. And so the thing that you've probably seen before is you can run commands like pip install, let's say Seaborn, any sort of library that you need in Python. You can do it right there in your Jupyter Notebook. And you can see that I already have Seaborn, so it's not actually doing anything here. But any package that you might need that you don't have, I find it annoying switching back and forth between my terminal window and Jupyter, so I sometimes like doing this. But one thing you might not know is that you can run all sorts of other commands within Jupyter Notebooks. I can run exclamation point ls. So I'm listing the directory contents. And we see in this folder we have a readme, we have the trips tips and tricks IPython notebook that we're working off of. And then we have a couple data files it looks like. And even cooler than this is we can like string multiple commands together. So I could do bang CD social data. So I wanna get into that folder. And then I want to look at everything that's in that folder. And we can see that we have a bunch of CSV files. And why this is useful is because I often find I need to like load a CSV, load a file, but I might not remember the exact name of it. So instead of opening up like a file explorer and like finding it there, I can just do this all in my Jupyter notebook and everything's a little bit neater. And you know, if things change, I can still see those updates. And just for the sake of, if you're curious about where this data is coming from, along with this video, I have a GitHub repo Data that's in this repo is just some social data, social media data for my channels that I collected off of a site called Social Blade. I'm gonna use this for a future video, so it's a little bit of a uh, you know future preview. You can clone this repo if you want to there, if you want data to work off of, but it's not necessary to clone this repo, but that is linked in the description. Okay, so now what do we, what else can we do with this? Well, you can run all sorts of fun commands. So one of my favorite bash commands is a command called cowsay. So I could do cowsay, Keith is 
Really cool. Run that and we see we get a nice little cow in our Jupyter Notebook. And I think one last thing I want to run, mention about these terminal commands in Jupyter, this is all using like whatever Linux system that we're running our Jupyter Notebook from. Let's say you're having issues with pip and you can't run this command. Jupyter also has what it's called magic lines built into its system. What I recommend is trying to do something like this. So percentage sign specifies a magic line, a magic command within pip. So you could try something like pip install uh, seaborn if the explanation doesn't work. Behind the scenes, it's probably gonna be doing pretty much the same thing. But there are special Jupyter specific magic commands that are available. You'll see one later in the video. So I'll, I'll link in the description of the visit, this video or in the GitHub repo some more details about these magic commands with the percentage signs specifically. Moving onward. Uh, and I'm gonna give you a sneak preview. You see me making all these cells and then I could delete these cells if I want to. The next thing we're going to walk through is some very useful shortcuts. All right, so what are some useful shortcuts you should know? Well, one of the ones I've been doing a lot is DD. So if you tap D twice, it's gonna delete a cell. And then if we wanna create some more cells, we can press B to create cells below. So the way I remember it is if you type in B, it will create a cell below. And if you type in A, it will create a cell above. So A above, B below. You might notice that if you're like typing in the cell, like I can type A, 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 it's not doing anything. So to get these shortcuts to work, the first thing you're gonna have to do is escape. So hit the escape can command on your keyboard, and then you can do A and B and delete cells with DD. Cool. So sometimes I like to make extra cells down below so that I can work higher up on the screen. Some other useful shortcuts or just things that you might want to do is like I could toggle the header here to make it a little bit more filling the screen. I could toggle the toolbar here, depending on how much room I want and how much distractions I want. Let's write out some of those shortcuts I just mentioned. So one is escape and then M, M for markdown. That's gonna be how we switch to markdown. M, switch to markdown, A, create cells above, B, create cells below, D plus D, that's gonna be delete a cell. And let me think if there's other ones. Another useful one is if we're switching to markdown, we wanna be able to switch back to code. So that's gonna be Y, Y is switch to code. So I've hit escape and then Y. Uh, we see that it changes kind of the format of the cell, but because this is text, we will want it to be markdown. Other useful shortcuts that you'll want to know, I'll wanna be able to run this. Control enter runs it in place and then shift enter will run the cell and then jump to the next one. Just to make this neater too, I'm gonna to add breaks between each of these lines. All right, and then control plus enter is run cell and stay on cell. Shift plus enter. So you're gonna be holding shift, pressing enter is uh, run cell and go to next. So this is just nicer, like when you don't have to take your hands off the keyboard, it's nicer than having to go up here and clicking run. But you can always do this. So shift enter. And again, I'm gonna just wanna create some breaks. Another thing I recommend, I always love using Markdown within my Jupyter Notebooks. It just makes things neater. So getting a hang of Markdown is definitely worthwhile. I think one other thing to keep in mind is that if you go into edit, one thing that I find pretty useful is find and replace. So let's say you had a data frame called DF. You could change it to maybe a more descriptive name like social DF or something like that. And you could replace all batches. You can use regexes within this. So find and replace often is useful too. It's not really a shortcut, uh, a useful command. So I'll just add that. I think that covers the shortcuts that I want to cover. So the third tip we're gonna cover is pandas. I'll say changing pandas display options. Make some cells below. Alrighty. So what do I mean by changing pandas display options? If we go back to one of our previous tips, if I look at LS, we see we have this, so, this CSV called social media data all. So I'm gonna load that into a data frame real quick. So import pandas as PD, 
I'll do df equals pd dot read csv social media data all dot csv run that df dot head. This is telling me all sorts of stats based on the date of how many subs I have, how many views I have. It has everything, got Instagram, followers on Twitter. One thing we should know is by doing DF head, it's just gonna list the first five rows, but let's say we wanted to see the first 100 rows and I did DF head 100. Well, we see that it cuts off and only lists 10 total rows here. And the reason before that is Pandas Baked In has a set max rows count. So if you exceed how many rows that is its max rows count, it's not going to display it. And we can see what that is by doing the following. We can do pd.options.display. And I don't remember this type of thing off the top of my head. I was just reviewing these before I made the video. So max rows what is that going to be equal we see it's 60. so if i did df head of let's say 50 everything's going to show up here because it's below that max rows count but if i do 75 you know it's going to do what we just saw with 100. one thing that's useful here is we can switch this within our Jupyter Notebook. And sometimes this makes sense. Sometimes it's better for Jupyter Notebooks to cut this off for us. We could say something like PD options display max rows equals. So we can see it by not having the equals, but if we add the equals, I can do something like 200, run this. And now if we run DF head 100 again, we're gonna be able to see every single thing in those first top 100 rows. It's not gonna cut them off. We're gonna see everything. Sometimes very, very useful, especially if you're like working with a data frame that only has 100 rows. It's nice to be able to see everything. Same thing with columns actually. So we can do pd.options.display.maxcolumns. If I run that, we see that 20 is the max number of columns that we can have. So I'll scroll all the way to the top. The max number of columns we can have is 20. In this situation, we don't actually have 20, so we see all the columns. But just like before, let's say you had 50 columns and you, when you were exploring your data, you wanted to be able to see them all. You could set something like max columns equals 50 and get everything contained in that display. Just kind of for proof, if I did max columns equals three and I run this, rerun head, we see, you get the index, you get the date and you get uploads. Other useful display options that you have within your fingertips, pd.options.display max column width. And I looked at a Medium article to help me kind of find some of these, so I'll link that in the description as well. If we just run this, we see that the max column width is 50. And so one thing to note, let's say you notice like some really text rich columns that you have are getting cut off. Well, you could change this parameter to something like 200 and now it's gonna be four times as wide at the max case. I'm not gonna bother with this for now because I don't need to change the column width. This is mostly numerical information. Good thing to have in your back pocket. Another useful one is gonna be pd.options.display.precision. So that is set to six. In this case, we don't actually use precision much. I guess average likes Instagram is kind of a, a useful thing that we do see some further precision. But what this is, is how many floating points that something will go to. And in this case, we're saying six is the max. If I set that to, let's say two, and then rerun the head here, we see that in situations like average likes Instagram, now we're only seeing two decimal points instead of the three that we saw before. Next tip is going to be setting up alerts in when cells finish, I'll say. And so what do I mean by setting up alerts when cells finish? When we're doing a lot of like complex process intensive jobs, especially like machine learning training jobs within our Jupyter Notebooks, they often take a while to run. So let's say we're building some sort of natural language processing model and it needs to train on a ton of data and it might take two hours to run. We don't really like, we'll run the cell and then kind of like hope that it finishes quickly enough, but we'll probably go off and do something else and won't really be paying attention to that specific cell. Maybe we come back six hours and it's finally done. But one thing that we can do is we can set up alerts within our operating system to 
send a kind of pop-up when the job is done, which definitely can be pretty useful if you wanna work on other things while your Jupyter Notebook cells are running. All right, so to start this one, what we're gonna to need to do is we're gonna to need to install pip install Jupyter Notify. Uh, as you can see that I already have this. Next, once we have Jupyter Notify, we're gonna load it into our Jupyter Notebook. So we can do that by using the magic line load extension. So this is kind of a built-in special command Jupyter Notebooks offer to us. So we're gonna load in what we just installed, which is Jupyter Notify. And then to actually use it, there's a couple of lines to keep in mind. And you know, I always have to kind of remind myself how to do this, but if you start using it enough, it'll become kind of more natural. So we run percentage percentage notify. And this is basically telling the cell, hey, when this cell finishes, let me know. Run something on my system and tell my system to let me know I'm done. For the sake of an example, I'm gonna import the time library of Python and I'm gonna import the random library. And so we're just gonna run a random length job uh, and kind of just let us have a system notification when it is done. So I'm gonna say, r equals random dot rand int. And let's say we wanted this job to take anywhere from 30 seconds to 60 seconds. You can imagine in the cases of training models, this might be three hours to six hours. We don't know exactly, but for the sake of an example, I'm gonna do r equals random rand int 30 to 60. And then I'm gonna do time dot sleep of whatever that random number is. And then I don't have to do this, but I'm just gonna run like cell finished executing at the, the bottom, I'm gonna print that out. So we can run this line and kind of in the background, I could let's say pop up, you know, my, the GitHub for this, you know, I could play around with things. So I just realized that when I, my screen recorder automatically turns on what's called focus assist. So the notifications don't pop up properly. So I'm gonna go over here and I'm going to click on focus assist settings and I'm gonna say off. I wanna get all notifications from your apps and contacts and I can exit out of this. And now I'm gonna run these two lines again. And in the meantime, so you can see kind of what's going on, I'll shamelessly plug my website, um, keithgalley.com, it's kind of cool. I made it with uh, what's called Webflow um, yeah, all sorts of fun stuff here. Look at that. Cell execution has finished. So what's useful about this is, I mean, there's a couple things. I can click on this and it will take me immediately back to my tab that has this open, which is nice. But just imagine that this isn't 30 to 60 seconds. This is two hours. Like we're doing something else. Like, and just note that like this code right here would be kind of replaced by ML like model training or something. Like it could be whatever. The biggest thing is that you put this percent percent notify at the top when you want it finished. All right, what else should we do in this video? Create a slideshow out of your notebook. There's a few different things here. So slides, subslide, fragments, skip, and notes. These are the five like options we have creating a slideshow with our Jupyter Notebook. And so when I say create a slideshow, like what the heck do I mean? Built into Jupyter Notebooks, there's some useful options. To access this, we're gonna want to go to view, and then we're gonna go to, go to cell toolbar, and then we're gonna want to do slideshow. And so if we do that, we see cell toolbar, slideshow. We see we get like different options for slide types on all of these. If we start specifying what we want each of these slide types to be, so like for this example, headers, it makes sense to have as a slide, but I'll make this a fragment. So my typical strategy is to make the header a slide and make these slide types of the other stuff fragments. And you'll see why in a second. Fragment. Fragment, slide, slide, or I guess not slide, that's a fragment, slide, fragment, fragment. There might be even shortcuts to do this, but you only have to do this once, so it's not the worst case. Fragment, 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 another slide, fragment, fragment and 
I'll make this a subslide just so you can see what I mean when we create a subslide. Slide, fragment, fragment. Okay, so everything's specified. Now let's see what happens when we make a slideshow out of this. So download as, and so this is file, download as, and then reveal.js slides. So this should work in any browser. Click that bad boy. Okay, this is what I was expecting. Maybe we had to rerun it, um, but I click on this. If I hit down, it pops up those fragments into the picture. So we see now we have the pip install seaborn command. If I hit up, it removes it. If I zoom out a little bit, it's adding that fragment below. So it's a little bit fidgety, the slideshow. Um, but then if we hit right, we get to a new slide, hit down, we see the fragments, hit right again, we're on our new slide, hit down, we start seeing fragments, um, keep going, keep going. The one thing is I've been having trouble, like it's not really resizing the screen. So the reason I use subslide versus fragment is when I start going off the screen, I'll probably just change the parameter so that everything can fit. So like a big parameter like df.head that shows a lot of information, I might make that a subslide instead of a fragment. And I'll show you how those changes affect things in just a second. Uh, setting of alerts. And commands like pip install Jupyter Notify, we might wanna just skip this or comment it out or delete the output just so it doesn't take up the entire space. And then create a slideshow of your notebook. Cool. So that is the slideshow in its core. You can play around with things a bit. So you can imagine like if you were, let's say in a meeting, like with your company, this is a good quick way to have something like nicely prepared from just your Jupyter notebook without having to set up, you know, a completely separate uh, PowerPoint presentation. And like the nice thing about this is it evolves with your, you know, the code that you change. You can keep playing around things. And then like, it does kind of annoy me having this view always here. So you can save all this information, but then do none. Oh, do none here and it's back to normal. But the way that the PowerPoint saved is still there. So that's PowerPoints in Jupyter Notebooks. All right, I think that's all we're gonna cover in this video. Hopefully these tips were helpful for you. If you did enjoy this video, it'd mean a lot to me if you throw it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks again to our sponsor, brilliant.org. Definitely check them out. Link in the description and first 200 people to sign up using that link can get 20% off an annual subscription. As always, check me out on the other socials as well, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. Till next time, everyone. This was fun, but peace out.